Termo to Madeline, Audio Edition, page 366, chapter titled, Termo and Madeline Through the Depression. Now as times changed, so did the two towns of the west side of the Madeline Plains. The population had dropped greatly, but travel was more extensive, as most people had access to a car of some kind. The railroad continued to expand, providing jobs and a need for local merchants and businesses of one sort or another. Now, in October of 1926, the NCO Railroad was sold to the Southern Pacific Company, ushering in a new era of railroading across the plains. Now, immediately upon signing the final papers, the SP began planning for broad-gauging the little NCO line. Now, starting in July of 1927, an all-out effort was begun in converting the line to standard gauge. The ties were placed under the old rails, and the heavier, wider tracks were placed one on each side of the narrow gauge rails. Now, by October of that same year, the new line was completed, from Wendell to Alturas. So all during the summer and fall, railroad workers flocked into the country, and business boomed for the local merchants. With the discontinuance of the narrow gauge lines between Wendell and Alturas, the overall total miles of narrow gauge tracked in the United States dropped by 7%. At Termo, during the broad gauging, there were two merchants. Actually, George and Elizabeth Green still owned the town, but they had returned to their home in the Calabas County. Tom Wood was leasing the general store and operating it during that time. The Greens at the beginning of the mechanical age and the influx of Model Ts to the Plains had built a garage. They had leased it out to Jim Brewer, and under his management, one could buy gas and oil and all the other goods and services that go along with the service station. That fall of 1927, the Greens sold Termo to Brewer, and everything went right along as it had done before. Brewer continued to operate the garage, and Tom Wood ran the store. Then in January of 1931, the town once again changed hands when Brewer sold everything to Wood. Jim Brewer stayed on a little while longer, working in the garage for Tom Wood. He lived in an upstairs apartment above the service station. That same year, when Tom Wood acquired the town of Termo, he also built an enormous hotel from a pile of narrow-gauge ties he had obtained from the railroad during the broad gauging. He and his wife moved into the new hotel. They also kept a post office there. Now, up at Madeline, the old hotel had changed management so much that the NCO officials had become disgruntled with the service during changeovers. The enterprising Mrs. Fritz, who was railroad agent at the time, while her husband was off partnering with B.F. Lineup and the new management of several northern California banks, made arrangements to provide the railroad with the services they were seeking. She bought the old Pope House on the west side of town and hired Tom Wood to move it for her and reconstruct it into an eating house. Tom, in turn, hired Jim Olson to do the moving, which was accomplished by one horse and a turntable wench affair. The house was set next to the railroad near where the original Fitz store had been. There, Tom Wood remodeled it, and the Fitz family went to feeding train crews. That was in 1923. Now, Mrs. Fritz's daughter, Lennis, who by now was married to Jack Kerr, came with her husband and family to operate the new establishment, which had been named the Tavern. They operated it for the next few years, hiring various people to work for them. Jack Kerr hired the first cook for the tavern in Sparks, Nevada. Leva Spencer was a widow with three children, Alta, Laura Bell, and Gordon. They moved to Madeline, and Mrs. Spencer began a job that was to last for the next good many years. In 1925, she married John Glavich, the former foreman of the NCO section of the gang at Madeline. Now, during the period of time, as a new eating establishment was running some very stiff competition to the old hotel, Floyd and Bella Evans, who were operating it, decided to expand their income earning possibilities by building a garage on the road nearest the hotel. About the same time, Frank Keene also built and operated a garage in Madeline to cash in on the new business of selling gas and services to the travelers. Frank operated his own garage, but the Evans hired Fred Wright, whom everyone knew as Gopher, to take care of theirs for them. Back over at the tavern, as the SP broad-gauging crew was working its way northward, Mrs. Fitz again decided to expand, and by this time the store was not providing the living that it once had. People could drive into Alturas or Susanville in their own cars and buy merchandise cheaper 
than they could at Madeline. So in looking for ways to keep making a living at Madeline, Mrs. Fitz once again hired Tom Wood to add on to the tavern. Rooms were built in anticipation for the large construction crews that were steadily moving up the railroad track. By the time the broad-gauging crews arrived, there were bedrooms aplenty, and the tavern began doing a land office business as a hotel as well as an eating establishment. It was shortly thereafter that the old original hotel was sold to Altura's business interests, torn down and rebuilt in Altura's. The history of Madeline would not be complete without the one person who came to Madeline to help out the tavern for a couple of weeks and ended up spending over 50 years there, Dolly Olson. Actually, her name was Flora, but everyone knew her as Dolly. At that time, just prior to the purchase of the NCO by the SP, she was Dolly Kelton. She had been living with her sister and brother-in-law, Arnie and Margaret Conklin at Ravendale, when she got word that a job was to open at the tavern. So that is when she boarded the NCO and moved up to Madeline to help out for a couple of weeks. She did everything that needed to be done around the bustling tavern, including making beds, cleaning house, waiting tables, and cooking. But then Carl Olson came around and swept her off her feet. They were married in 1927 and spent the next couple of years at Likely and other neighboring communities. Then, in 1929, Carl and Dolly moved back to Madeline and took over the old home ranch. Carl's parents moved to Gridley at that time. Now, Dolly and her sister, Margaret, were not the only ones of the Keltons to live on the Madeline Plains. Tad Kelton worked around the plains at various jobs, and another sister, Sidney, and her husband, Clarence Bington, farmed Bill Cochran's place for a while. Now, Jack and Lennis Kerr were not the only operators of the tavern either. Joe and Emma Zolig ran it for several years, and their daughter Nellie and her first husband ran it for a while also. It was not until Prohibition was over that John Ardens got it. Up to that time, the tavern, unlike the original hotel, had operated strictly legal and had not sold or allowed a bootleg booze, Beer was sold there, however, starting immediately upon the passage of the 3.2% beer bill by Congress. Then, when the Prohibition ended, John Ardens introduced the first hard liquor at the tavern. Being a typical Bosco sheepman, he was famous for the lamb basque that he put on during his operation at the establishment. There was another family who came to Madeline during this time, although they were not associated with the tavern. James and Anna Bradford came in the late 1920s with their four children, Walter, Dwayne, Alvin, and Wanda. Now, Mr. Bradford was the station engineer or pumper for the SP. He kept the big diesel motors going day and night that pumped the water into the enormous iron water tank that the SP had built upon completion of the new line. And Mrs. Bradford ran the post office during those years. All right, next chapter, titled Madeline Plains Characters. The droth, the depression, and the hard times seemed to bring in an abundance of characters out of the woodworks of the Madeline Plains in the late 1920s in early 1930s. Of course, the most normal of persons had to be a little bit odd for even coming to the Plains in the first place. Now, probably there were no more characters around during the Depression than any other time, but those who were here were outstanding. They never hurt anybody and gave everyone something to talk about. Before we of this pampered generation make any hasty judgments, We should probably live a year or two under the above-mentioned hard times. Now, generally speaking, to be a certified and accredited Madeline Plains character, a person had to meet three qualifications, all of which were easy to pass if one worked at it just a little. First off, a bachelor status was required. This was not too difficult because the fairer sex, or should it be said wiser, was still not plentiful enough to go around. Secondly, he who aspired to be one of the infamous characters of the plains had to be a stranger to water. Again, this was easy because during the drought, water was seldom seen in any form on the Madeline Plains. But a true character had never 
even heard of the word bathtub. At least if he had, he could not know what it meant. And lastly, a real character had to get involved in alcohol, whether in the drinking or in the manufacturing. Generally, a top-notch character did a little or a lot of both. Now, Coal Oil Charlie was one who took care of both ends of the booze business. It is not we are leaving out his true name to protect the innocent. There was no such thing on the Madeline Plains in those years. It is just that nobody ever knew Coal Oil Charlie under any other name. He lived down at Termo, or over with Harve and Vedeline Williams, or with whoever else would put up with him. He worked for the county road department whenever he had time between running off batches of moonshine. Once at a termo dance, when a few young boys tried to get him to sell them some hooch, he told them he would oblige them if they were men enough to handle it. Now with that, he let them try a little of his best whiskey. He had just run it down, and it was pushing 200 proof. They said it was hot enough to burn the skin off the lips before they were even touched the bottle. As hot as his fire water may have been, it was the other legitimate job that burned coal oil Charlie up. A county truck somehow caught fire at Dry Valley, and he was killed in the blaze. Now, Bill Cochran. Bill Cochran was another character, but he was more outstanding in the category of water than of alcohol. In fact, they say that Bill never changed clothes, let alone took a bath. Whenever one set of clothing became so worn and dingy that it could hardly have been classified as a covering, Bill would just put on a brand new suit of clothes. Now, it must have taken quite a while for the set next to his skin to either rot off or be absorbed into the system, because at any one time he wore more than his share of clothes. That fact was asserted one day when poor old Bill got deathly sick. They hauled him into the tavern, and a doctor was summoned. But even after the doc got there, they almost lost him before they found a body under all those clothes. Anyway, old Bill had another quirk that made him stand out amongst his neighbors, the lesser characters of the Madeline Plains. He loved to ride in an automobile. They claimed that all one had to do was open the door of his car as if it were to go somewhere, and Bill would be there and jump in before the door could be closed. Now, Harry Lee held the title of town character, or town drunk, depending on one's viewpoint, in the town of Madeline. Harry was a trapper by trade and lived in a cabin up by the irrigation canal on the north side of town. He was a great storyteller who had fought wild Indians from the Mississippi River all the way down the Oregon Territory. He worked a lot for Mrs. Fritz in the store when he was not hitting the bottle too heavily. But when he got on the booze, he took on the characteristics of a submarine commander. He would go down and not come up to the surface for two or three weeks at a time. Harry provided some of the entertainment to the Madeline, like the time he came into the tavern cross-eyed and on tiptoes during one of his binges. He pulled out his pistol and proceeded to shoot the eyes out of the deer heads hanging on the walls. It is doubtful if he ever hit one of the heads, let alone the eyes, but his precision shooting was close enough that he did manage to hit the building from inside the room and send people scurrying. Harry had a Model T pickup and a yellow dog. Where one of the three went, all three went. No matter how long Harry visited or how drunk he got, the yellow dog always guarded the pickup. He was a one-man dog and would have nothing to do with anybody else. Now, when Harry died, the dog laid right outside the house and guarded the door. Who it was that first missed Harry Lee is unknown. Maybe it was his bootlegger who first went to check on him, and at any rate... When they, got, when they went to get the body out of the house, the yellow dog had to be tied before anyone could get in. After the burial, the dog refused to eat or to even look at another person. 
Finally, he had to be shot because he would have nothing to do with anyone but Harry Lee. Harry Lee was buried in the Madeline Cemetery, and his gravestone gives unrefutable evidence that the world's biggest characters always come to the Madeline Plains. All right, next chapter titled, Those Old Time Dances. Those who wonder what folks did in the Madeline Plains for entertainment never attended a dance at Termo. They never danced all night in one of the schoolhouses or one of the homestead shacks. They would not remember the thrill of the dance while a pot stove burned cherry red at one end of the building and all the nail heads of the far end of the house glistened with frost. They never had the wonderful experience of hearing Harvey Williams fiddle all night long and watching the instruments sag as the night wore on. Long before morning arrived, he would be sitting in a chair, dragging his bow across the strings of the fiddle as it sat in his lap. Nor would they remember the fast-paced chants of Wes and Roscoe Philman as they called out square dances and Virginia reels. Oh, and to think of those poor people who have never sat down to a midnight supper in the presence of a bunch of Madeline Plainers party-goers. And then to be there at daylight when the dance broke up and the ladies cooked breakfast for everyone. And the memories of the little children as they woke up from under the piles of coats on the benches. Their mothers had put them to bed there last night when they got too sleepy to dance and play anymore. Now it was time to eat breakfast and go home. Oh yes, what splendid memories for those who experienced it. And we speak of entertainment today. Those who attended the old-time dances know what true entertainment that hardly exists today. For truly, those old-time dances where, where everyone went, old and young, those who could dance and those who had two left feet, are a thing of the past. Harvey Williams, of course, was not the only musician. Daisy MacDonald often accompanied him on the piano around the Brockman era, and his wife... Vedeline, she played the guitar. Up at Madeline, Nora Maurer played the piano, as did Mrs. McDonald. Both were superb piano players. When Nora got tired, her daughter Mary would play for a while. As time progressed on into the late 20s and early 30s, Tommy Wood and Norman Talbot played harmonizing saxophones while Lawrence Wood accompanied them on the drums. And, of course, Mrs. MacDonald was still there to play the piano in that band. Madeliners danced most all kinds of dances. But they were unfortunate in not having anyone who could call out square dances in those years. They had to go down to the Termo or to the MacDonald Peak Schools or over to the old Whittinger place where Frank and Davina Davidson often hosted dances. The Philmans would always make it to the dances there and put the people through several lively squares. Stephen Ansel helped out in the dances on that end of the valley by playing a mandolin. And young Alice Metcalf was given a fiddle on her 12th birthday by her father Isaac. By the time she was 14, she was playing for all the dances at the end of the plains. Asulo Lasco provided her transportation to the dances, to and from the dances with a chaperone, of course. Now, when Harvey Williams was not playing for a dance, no one had more fun or loved to dance more than he unless maybe it was his own little dar- daughter, Mary, or John Nelson, May or John Nelson. Often during those days of Prohibition, Harvey could be seen dancing along, chanting to the beat of the music. My shirt tail's out, but I can't help that, as his drooping shirt tail covered the whiskey flask in his hind pocket. Yet those were the days, after not seeing people for weeks at a time and then having the privilege of traveling to a dance, often through the snow in a horse-drawn buggy or a rattling Model T Ford. And never since have later generations experienced anything as fun or as fulfilling. Heaven really must have get-togethers like that, like the Madeline Plains dances of the years gone by. And who, who knows? Maybe Harvey Williams is up there right now, playing on his fiddle. All right, we'll stop there. Next chapter is titled... Uh, Madeline Fires, The Loss of Another Schoolhouse, and that's going to be on page 375. Have a great day.